In the depths of slumber, a young boy's eyes flickered open to find himself in a dazzling room, glowing white all around. Startled, he heard a mysterious voice praising his composure in the strange situation. Curious and bewildered, he inquired about his whereabouts, and the singer revealed they were in the enigmatic Soul Hiker Room, a place where the path for his soul journey and future destiny would be decided. But there was a shocking twist. The boy had passed away while he slept, unbeknownst to him, for he had stopped breathing. Faced with the chance to choose his destiny, the boy made a spontaneous decision and selected the fascinating vampire race without hesitation. Suddenly, he was transformed into a female vampire, filled with the allure of blood and an irresistible pull toward its scent. In a heartbeat, she was drawn to a nearby carriage, which had fallen victim to a ruthless gang of bandits. As fate would have it, the female vampire crossed paths with one of the carriage's wounded occupants. Hungry and curious, she struck a deal with him, aid in battling the bandits, and he would be rewarded with a meal. Empowered by her wind magic skills, she bravely fought alongside the victim, rescuing him from the clutches of the wicked marauders. Grateful for her help, the boy, now known as Argon, a shortened version of her actual name, Argento Vampire, was offered nourishment and clothing by the appreciative victim, Zeno Kotobuki. Zeno was seen as he brought Argon into a town named Araresha. Zeno then gave her some money as gratitude for saving him and advised the lords of the city, who are fond of girls like Argon. Meanwhile, Argon recalled her past as a guy, to which she thought of the prospect of marrying Zeno, a traitor, but she felt she wouldn't be able to freeload as he might live in one place until he gets old. Argon later went on her way after bidding them farewell. However, Argon is later seen as feeling hungry and exhausted due to the lack of blood, as she doesn't want to, but she is barely at her limits, to the point that she even wonders if she made a mistake by becoming a vampire. She had no choice but to flee into the back alley, and if that went on, she might bite one of the many people around. And then sucking her blood is not a permanent solution. Argon eventually collapsed. She later woke up and found herself on a bed, where she saw a young lady who introduced herself as Felnut Layla. Argon introduced herself as well, and was grateful for rescuing her. Argon got to know that Layla is blind due to an encounter she had with a magical beast years ago and wasn't able to treat it. Argon was touched by her story and healed her from her blindness. Layla was so excited that she stated she was ready to help however she could. Argon then said that she would love to suck her blood, and to her surprise, Layla accepted and even cut her wrist. She had the blood in the cup and gave it to Argon, who was grateful and healed her. Meanwhile, Layla seemed ready to split her wrist again, but was stopped by Argon. Layla was surprised when she saw that Argon wasn't wearing any clothes, and then she used magic to cleanse herself, as she believed that taking a bath was quite a hassle for her. And then Layla noticed that Argon didn't wear anything beneath the cloth she had on, so she went shopping to get her underwear at a store. Layla was then seen as she helped her select and wear some clothes. Meanwhile, after a long while, they finished shopping, walked along the street, and had a fun time together. Meanwhile, Argon noticed that Layla wanted to look at her surroundings for herself, as she had been in the dark until the previous day when she met Argon, who healed her eyes. Layla was then seen as she advised Argon to be careful so that people wouldn't know about her identity as a vampire. Argon was later seen as she began the sale of healing magic, to which people were impressed and referred to her as the silver-haired vampire girl. However, a young man was seen as he discussed the prospect of wanting to take Argon as his wife. Argon met Layla asleep on coming home, so he prepared some meals. Layla immediately woke up and saw Argon preparing the food, who then asked her to eat some. Layla was then seen as she doubted Argon's cooking, to which he later changed his mind, and she was also surprised. However, Layla was endeared by Argon's cooking as well. And later, outside, a young man whom the people referred to as the prince was seen as he came to profess his love to a girl. He introduced himself as Samaka Suwaro, which he claimed from the king with the administration of Aruresha. However, Lila came at the time and met Samaka Suwaro, whom they had all professed to before. However, Samaka Suwaro was seen as he calmly brought Argon and Layla to his house and tried to profess his love again, 
but he was interrupted by an emergency call named the Abyss Call. Argen and Samaka were seen outside as they watched a giant monster wreaking havoc on the ships, which is what we call an Abyss Call. Argen felt that the beast looked like a giant octopus. Meanwhile, Samaka was seen as he advised Argen that during the heat of the upcoming battle, he should flee the city, and although it saddens him, after the war, he must report her existence to the king. Argon thought about what Samaka said, and knew that she would indeed be caught if Samaka reported her, and she didn't escape at all, so she might even get Layla into trouble. But then she does not want to leave the city, so she offers to assist by providing a blood contract, meaning she is a vampire. She tried to communicate with the monster, who eventually replied, showing its disinterest, so she brought out the blood she collected from Samaka, who got it from his soldiers. Argon doesn't want to sit idly, knowing that the city perfect for her napping will be attacked and destroyed, so she attempts to stop the rampage. Meanwhile, Layla was later seen as she came to meet Samaka and asked about Argon, who replied that he couldn't say much about it. Argon woke up and dreamed about his past, his bad memories of what happened before he appeared in his current world. Meanwhile, that's why he continued sleeping amid that world, because he felt that was what people wanted him to do, and he would surely do it, and that the only thing he wanted was to fall asleep entirely with a smile. Argon recapped what he did to destroy a monster called an Abyss Call. Argon had already left the city, and based on Samaka's character, he would report his existence to the king, so she had to get out of the town completely as fast as possible. He thought about his survival, which he could still manage for three days, but then she wanted to come over and just waste his time. Still, she got attracted by the scent, to which he saw a beast that could talk and try to attack her, but was subdued by her. And then they cleared the misunderstanding, to which Argon got to know the name of the Minotaur, Oswald. With the help of Oswald, Argon met a horse, which he named Bahaki, as he won the race challenge asked by Bahaki before it could allow her to ride it. Argon then reasoned that it seemed she smelled the scent of the blood, but then she saw that Bahaki made a weird face, which meant that something could have been troubling his mind, and she had loved the look he made whenever he said his name. Argon could perceive the smell of the dried blood of people. Bihaki told her that it seemed the protectors of the forest were fighting, which Argon also confirmed as she said that she heard Oswald's voice, but the fight was not going well, so he told Bahaki to follow her while she went ahead, and Bahaki wondered what she was up to. Meanwhile, Oswald and a young girl covered in hoods were seen fighting each other as Oswald tried to attack her, but it did not affect the lady. Oswald was then worried about the lady as his attack towards her did not affect her. Instead, his ears and vision were busy as he could not hear well anymore, and Oswald knew that if he died, the Forster would have been lost. Also, the lives of all its inhabitants would be lost as well. Hence, he had to protect them as he was the only one who could fight. Arjean saw Oswald and went to his rescue, asking him if he was fine, but Oswald replied that he could not hear her as his eardrums were destroyed. Argon and they healed Oswald, and gradually the deafness was gone and he was back to full strength. The young lady in the hood was shocked as she could not believe anyone in that world was faster than her the way Argon did. Argon helped them spot the lady and she won due to his agility, where she could manipulate friction, which allowed him to move, react, and counter at incredibly high speeds. Argon was able to tie herself to the lady and drag her to follow her until the smell of people was getting further away, and she asked the lady's name. However, the lady did not tell her first. She later replied that her name was Chrome, while Argon also introduced herself. Some days later, Chrome challenged Argon not to look at her that much, but deep inside Argon, she did not want to bite Chrome's neck to drink her blood. Argon was seen as she bit into Chrome's neck and had some blood for herself, which turned out to be too much, and Chrome was shocked and scared of her, so she immediately ran away as soon as Argon was done sucking her blood. However, Argon noticed her status, which was almost at level 8 and much higher than that of Layla. However, Argon brushed the thought aside and napped just like always. A while later, Argon woke up due to a call made by Bahaki. Then she noticed a giant bird flying in the sky that attacked by spitting venom rain, 
So Argon immediately used the wind magic to blow the rain away, and then asked Oswald and Bahaki about what they should do about the situation they were in. Argon then said she had thrown boulders and trees at the bird, but could not reach it as it flew high. So Argon was seen as she jumped high and reached the height of the bird, which tried to attack, but was evaded by Argon, who used the wind magic. However, Argon seemed to be hit by the bird's attack, which concerned Oswald. However, Argon made use of the blood, which she passed to Oswald, who was given the blood chain made by Argon, which she used to hold the bird and tie it. Meanwhile, during this time, Argon was seen falling due to the exhaustion of much blood and being unable to control her fall. However, the bird was seen as it turned her feathers into sharp objects, which it used to attack Oswald so it could escape. But Oswald didn't give in. Meanwhile, Argon was seen as she managed to get up, but was weak due to the extensive use of the blood. Still, she gathered all her strength and assisted Oswald, and they were able to defeat the bird, to which the creatures in the forest were grateful for Argon's help. And then Argon left the forest. Lila was seen in a carriage driven by Zeno, and they were on their way to the Republic, where they had conversations with themselves as they journeyed. Lila was then seen having some thoughts about the Republic she was heading to, and then she thought about Argon, who left her without saying goodbye, to which she felt that she must be enjoying her sleep as she had always done. Layla continued talking to herself, to which Zeno learned that it was Argon that Layla was thinking about, and she almost had an accident with the carriage. However, Argon was seen with Bahaki as they journeyed to the city's border and had a blood contract with the horse so it could run faster. However, they were attacked by a fox girl, Kuzuha, so Argon explained that she was a demi-human just like them and did not need them to attack her. Kuzuha then apologized for her actions as soon as she got to know that Argon was a demi-human, and she then brought Argon to a stable. However, Argon felt that if Kuzuha were an adult, she would have fed her. Kuzuha then explained that she was there due to an order from a particular person, that her mother was cooperating with the village lord, and that she wanted to alleviate her and the village lord's worries by patrolling and destroying the monsters she encountered now and then. However, Argon was seen as she was asleep until night and was woken up by Kuzuha, who asked her to have some food, which her village lord provided. However, the food was not good, and Argon could relate while Kuzuha was malnourished. However, she managed to eat it and then went outside, where she encountered Kuzuha's mother, who was dead and only left a magical video for her daughter, whom she loved very much. However, at that moment, a voice was heard saying it wonders what kind of guest Argon is. The voice resonated through the air, emanating from the lips of a young man whose eyes gleamed with an unsettling mixture of malice and determination. Clutched firmly in his grasp was an ornate staff, its intricate carvings hinting at its arcane purpose. He stood before Argon, a mysterious figure with an aura of power that was captivating and foreboding. His words cut through the tension, a chilling declaration that sent shivers down Argon's spine. He revealed a grim tale of deception and darkness, explaining how he had cunningly poisoned Kuzuha's mother and, with sinister proficiency, drained her life force to augment his magical abilities. The man's voice dripped with a disturbing calmness as he outlined his twisted plan, detailing his intention to repeat this horrifying process with Kuzuha once she came of age transforming her into a vessel of magical experimentation. As the conversation unfolded, the young man's keen perception picked up on something different about Argon. A subtle spark of recognition glinted in his eyes as he peered into the depths of her being, recognizing that she was not quite like the ordinary humans he was accustomed to encountering. Suddenly, without warning, the tense atmosphere erupted into violence. The man's staff crackled with dark energy as he lunged at Argon, launching a series of magical assaults. Yet, to his surprise and dismay, Argon met each attack with a graceful mastery that defied her apparent humanity. Her movements flowed effortlessly, evading spells with a dancer's finesse and countering with bursts of her elemental magic. The battle raged on, a clash of opposing forces, until Argon's sheer skill and resilience overcame the young man's evil intentions. She incapacitated him with a final, decisive maneuver, leaving him sprawled on the ground, defeated and powerless. She brought Kuzuha's mother's body back for Kuzuha, who was shocked and cried when she discovered that her mother was dead. 
Kuzuha leveled up as soon as Argon cut off her collar. She then went to eliminate the village lord who killed her mother. Meanwhile, Argon was seen as she left with Bahaki. Argon wanted to wear Chrome's clothes, so she returned to sleep, which Bihaki agreed to since she only woke up due to sneezing. Argon knew that with Bihaki, they could pass the mountains and reach the Republic that day. Argon then told Bihaki to wake her up whenever he felt hungry. Kuzuha, who went to mourn her mother's death at her graceyard, returned late, and before she returned, Bihaki was already going, and she had to move after him. Kuzuha then went on to Argon and told her she hoped they got along. They then told Bahaki to let them continue the journey. Argon asked Kuzuha if she had brought clothes, but Luzuk replied that she was already considering measuring Argon's girlfriend's new clothes. Argon was surprised that Kuzuha could sew clothes. Luzuha then promises Argon that she can finish the dress in a day. The next day, Argon was astonished by the speed with which she completed the work she gave Kuzuha about sewing her a new dress, so she asked Kuzuha if she was able to sleep at night, and she explained that she left the pro essay to a clone where he could get some sleep. Argon was shocked that the clone could also sew clothes. Argon could also remember that before reincarnating into Quan Estate, people wore the same clothes as the house's caretakers. Luzuha also promised again that she would give her another set of clothes if she had time. They finally returned to Bahaki, and Argon apologized for keeping him late as she showed him the money he had made. Kuzuha was already surprised by the name Bahaki over there, and Argon replied that she was the one who would bestow him the title. And when it started to get dark, Kuzuha suggested they get off the slopes before night appeared. They then went out to practice the sword as they reached a place to rest, although Argon had learned a little about handling the sword as a child from the Quan family. While they were practicing, they were surprised to see their blade cut out, and they thought that it was inevitable if they gave a pre-compile name. Meanwhile, with the addition of the Terrier Bandits, they had compromised and agreed that they would have the same goal of passing through without brewing any trouble. Then, Argon began conversing with the Bandits. Argon asked what Terra did, who then explained that he drew the attention of the Border Guards away from them so that they could battle each other without any interference. Argon was surprised that the Bandits wanted a revenge match with him. Meanwhile, Argon obliged them, but she could still defeat them quickly, just as before. However, Terrier was seen as he made a sneak attack at Argon, who dodged the attack and turned into a mist. Then, she was able to defeat Terrier as well, and she bound them together with a blood chain and then left after she had already healed them. Meanwhile, Terrier and his men were seen as they untied themselves, which they claimed would make her regret the humiliation she made them pass through. Meanwhile, Kuzuha and Argon were seen as they made their way to the new city. Kuzuha and Argon were seen as they got to the new city called Sakurazaka, the place Kuzuha wanted to know before they went to the capital, Sakuranomiya. They walked around the town, and Argon was feeling nostalgic, as that made her recall her past life, as she was prohibited from going outside and didn't even get to look at any real cherry blossoms. Initially, the Republic boasted of having the most races living inside it. Still, Sakurazaka is the one that helped make that come true, and then they noticed that people were also wearing kimonos. After a while, they got to the Sakura Garden, the most famous onsen inn in Sakurazaka, and Kuzuha brought them into the garden. And then, after settling in an inn, Kuzuha and Argon were seen conversing together like best friends. And they got to meet Satsuki Ichinos, a vampire and not much of a daywalker like Argon, but was also quite interested in learning. Meanwhile, Satsuki loved the duo, and they went out together, where they encountered a monster that landed in front of them.